Welcome to what I think can best be described as my first ever podcast. Today we're doing something a little different. For my last video I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dumfluff to discuss the fundamentals behind Soviet doctrine during the Cold War era and how to apply that to combat mission. And our conversation was so engaging that it ended up going on for almost four hours. So there was just so much good material lying on the cutting room floor after the 20 minute video was done that I decided to take the best bits and upload them here in this podcast form as well. Then after the video was released, we noticed that in the comment section on YouTube, um, some questions and comments were coming back repeatedly. So we decided to jump back into the studio to go deeper on those specific topics. Uh, think about things like how to defend against a Soviet attack as the US Army and whether this doctrine would work if you took a BDR battalion rather than a BMP-1 and uh, whether to bring more cheap tanks or fewer expensive ones if you're going for mass, etc. So the first 45 minutes or so of this podcast is material left over from the video and the second 45 minutes is us diving into questions and comments from the YouTube comment section to shed some extra light on those topics. I can imagine that you're not here for the full 90-ish minute ride, so in that case just jump to whatever you'd like to know more about using the timestamps that I've put in the description. So. Strap in, grab your fermented potato juice and salted sunflower seeds and let's dive into some more Cold War Soviet doctrine. There's this whole Soviet doctrine, a very specific doctrine that you can choose to either emulate while playing combat mission Cold War or not. Now, what traits do you feel the Soviet army has in CM Cold War that would facilitate or perhaps even encourage following this doctrine? Yeah, so I think the major one is, is cost, essentially, at least in quick battle terms. Um, you can get a tremendous amount of units for the same cost as mm. as um, US ones, and it's partly because you know the the design of an M60 or whatever is designed to be this multi-purpose uh, thing. It's supposed to do many different tasks um, simultaneously, and that's just not the case for for a Soviet tank. A Soviet tank has one job. Right. Um, it's, it's very simple. It's going to go forward and do the thing, and it's going to is going to pursue that. Um, so yes, you get you get more ammunition for your artillery. You get more more bodies on the on the field, um, and I think ultimately that is what pushes you in that direction. Um, also, of course, the things like the poorer spotting uh, really forces you to mass. So it sort of goes hand in hand, really. Um, mm, so because the American kit costs more, this doctrine wouldn't really work for the U.S. Army. Yes. Well, you'd also you'd also be inefficient, yeah. basically. You'd be throwing away the advantages that you have <clears throat> to do something that's a lot simpler, and that's potentially I mean, you could it could still work, but it's not. Um, you're not you're not taking advantage of what you're being given. Um, again, the smoke's a good example, right? The you cannot do a smoke screen with the US in the same way as I was doing in that in that battle. Um, the vehicle smoke does not do mm -hmm. that. Uh, and so, if you're not, if you're trying to, then you're not doing vehicles. You're not using the vehicle smoke for what it's for, which is fighting hold down and giving yourself protection and relocating to other positions and doing burn drills. Could you elaborate on the vehicle smoke? Soviet smoke launches are very different to how the NATO ones are used. Uh, they are slow burning, uh, and mm -hmm. they they fired forward about, about 120 meters. Well, that because they're fired forwards. Uh, that means, and because they're slow burning, it means they cover a much larger area. And so rather than being a defensive thing, where you're popping smoke and then driving backwards behind a hill, they're a more offensive thing, because they give you a screen to maneuver behind. Right, they're, they're for a whole different purpose than, than exactly. the NATO smoke launchers. Right. Exactly. Uh, so, I mean, the purpose, it's actually a lot like, um, it's a, it's a lot like uh, uh, football. Uh, if you were a single, if you're a single player with a ball and you're coming towards the goal, um, then the goalkeeper should come towards you, because what they're doing is they're cutting down the angles at which you can see the goal. So, so relatively, right. the keeper looks a lot bigger, and suddenly you can't, you've got less room to maneuver. It's the same kind of principle. If you're shooting the smoke forwards, then there's there's a far you can see far less of the of the area, and you're covering a much wider arc behind it. Right. It obviously means they're less good defensively, but, you know, offensively. Uh, so you mentioned the design of the vehicles. How have the vehicles been designed around this doctrine? Ah, so 
the the interesting thing about the Soviet hardware is it's very sort of it's very blunt and brutal. Uh, it's very it's very single purpose. Uh, it means that everything has its role and does its role, but isn't necessarily very good outside of its role. So, uh, for example, the uh, the one of the issues with the Soviet tanks, uh, they're as low and small as possible, and they're as light as possible, because um, they're only like 40 mm-hmm. ton tanks. Like a T-72 is only 40 tons, which is, is significantly lighter than Abrams or, or whatever, which is go, go up there like 60 and 70 tons when you go to uh, <coughs> the larger tanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and they do that by you know shaving a crew member because they don't have a, a loader because they have auto loader or whatever else. Um, but it also means that they they limit they they lack in things like gun depression, so they can't use a uh, hold down as effectively, which doesn't matter because your 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 principle is is to attack and to to carry out these kind of these kind of situations. Further to that, you have situations like the BMP, and the BMP one when it came into service was. Uh, revolutionary. And in combat mission, it has generally gotten uh, a bit of a short stick because the the two situations where we've seen them prior to Cold War has been shock force, where there are 1960s uh, vehicle being crewed by conscript Syrians, uh, which is fighting in 2008 um, against, you know, the brand new American kit, uh, or Black Sea, where uh, the BMP-2 or BMP-3 is being crewed by the Russians, which are a lot better, uh, but they're nowhere near as as still still at least a generation behind what the Americans what the Americans are fielding. Uh, but in Cold War, uh, suddenly they're not. The thing with the BMP is that the BMP the BMP-1 in particular, uh, it's an infantry fighting vehicle, so it's a it's a troop carrier, but it's a troop carrier which is also a fighting vehicle. And the BMP one, uh, the BMP will carry a machine gun. It will carry uh, a ATGM, which means mm-hmm. uh, in Cold War especially, uh, tanks are generally pretty useless outside of maybe one and a half kilometers, maybe two if you push it. Um, but with an ATGM, you can get two, two and a half, maybe three kilometers of range on there. So that means that every single one of your like, infantry fighting vehicles can outrange all of the uh, NATO tanks. Further, the 73 mil low velocity gun, uh, the heat round of that can penetrate uh, every single NATO tank in the Cold War uh, frontally. So it's still you know likely to miss, and it's still not great, and I still wouldn't want to go one on one with it. But it does mean that every single vehicle you have on the Soviet side is capable of dealing with absolutely everything on the NATO side. Which right. just means your your threats just multiply tremendously, and the amount of things you can put down at one time are uh, are quite kind of staggering. Right, and that ties into the uh, war as a science, where you can calculate success. Yes, I mean again, it's, it's a lot of it just comes to mass. A lot of it just comes down to having having so many threats at one time that you're you're getting so many dice rolls, and some of them are going to come up right. And even if your vehicles and your your situation is, is is worse in every way, it doesn't matter because you know I'm rolling thirty dice and you're rolling five. So about the attack in Ashlands, first comes the combat reconnaissance patrol, then comes the forward security element, and lastly the main body. If I'm going to play a quick battle against someone and I want to buy my vehicles for the combat reconnaissance patrol, what do I get? So CRP is almost always going to be in the same IFs as the, as the battalion. So it would be, in this case, BMP-1Bs, but it could be BTRs or MTLBs or whatever they're doing. Uh, sometimes that CRP could have a single tank as well. Um, I didn't bother in that case, in this case. Uh, but there are situations where you'd actually want to do that. And reconnaissance with with uh, tanks is, a, is very much a Soviet thing. Um, the things like the BRDMs, like the actual dedicated scout cars, which aren't on this map, <coughs> aren't in this force, are the scout, the recon elements that would have been in advance of this force. So they they would have been preparing the route. So they would be doing things like uh, checking to see whether bridges are up or if there's any um, like nuclear contamination or um, you know the roads are clear. There's no no there's no mines or abattises or anything else that's going to going to stop you uh, so those are in this context not really appropriate for the battle 
because they already would have been here. Basically, their job mm -hmm. would have been to say there is enemy somewhere in this map, if you like, which we know because we're yeah. playing a battle. So they've already done their mm -hmm. job. I know yeah. there's a battle enemy here. Right, so the scouts in the BRDMs have determined that there's enemy in this area, and then the combat reconnaissance patrol goes in first to see where exactly they are. Uh, and the that's what you see out of there. But the idea is fundamentally that at minimum, at minimal cost, you're learning, you're learning, and you're creating, you're creating a situation that you can then exploit um, with, with as much as possible. Yeah. So, so that's the reason why they go forward with one platoon exactly. rather yeah, than. Yeah. Because if I sent, if I sent the point, the problem is you could send forward an entire battalion at once. Okay. I could just, I could click go, and I could send mm -hmm. the entire battalion over the hill in one side, and maybe I get lucky. Right. Maybe I win. Maybe your defenses are really weak in that position, yep. and it's just the exact right choice. I've got no information. I've just guessed, but I've just rolled over and everything's dead. Great. Um, but it's probably not going to work that way. <laughs> so, so this is the echelon. This is this is why each one has to then set the conditions for the other one. Because based on what the FSC, what the CRP has done, the FSC is going to have choices about how it's going to engage this. If the CRP were to uh, immediately get wiped out and I get zero spots, like I, I crest this hill, you know, 30 toes fly at me, and I learn nothing at all, um, other than there's lots of toes here, mm -hmm. uh, then the CRP then should be, well, is then forced to uh, do its own reconnaissance. So it's supposed to, uh, it's supposed to either choose to, to engage in the same area or bypass. If it's really heavy AT, it's going to bypass. Uh, but either way, it means that CRP is then going to do more of a probing, cautious attack, where it's sneaking forwards and it's 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 trying to be as cautious but safe as possible, and and still find the information which it has lacked because the CRP hasn't done its job. Right, but where, where you say CRP uh, will have to do its own reconnaissance, you mean the FSC yes, would have to do its own reconnaissance? Yes, the FSC would have to do its own reconnaissance. So it would send forward. It would send forward. Um, you know, it, it would it would move more cautiously. It would it would do in small bounds. It would be a lot slower, which is mass and tempo it's the main main problem of the game uh but it would it would have to do that because it doesn't have the information it would otherwise have so if the crp dies why not just appoint a new platoon and say congratulations you are now the crp so the problem with that is that you start you start piecemealing so if you send forward another platoon and that also that platoon also dies then suddenly you're you just end up dying by a thousand cuts and that takes time so not only are you not massing, but you're also not tempoing, and you get you get none, you get none of your advantages. So you don't have uh, you don't have the yeah you don't have the advantages which you should have fundamentally. So no, at that point you've got to suck it up and and do with what you things that things are going badly for you. Basically, if, if the at that point if the CRP has been wiped out, you are losing at that point. You have you have a disadvantage. So you're having to try to turn that around as yeah. something good. I think that if the CRP dies in one blow, then you've probably run into a point in the enemy defenses where you don't want to be at all for the attack. But unlike in real life, in combat mission, you can't then just decide to bypass that point because it's a relatively small map and the point is probably a game objective. So can you respond to that situation in combat mission as you would in real life? Ah, but, but even, uh, even bypass a particular position. So again, let's say for example where that toe is on the side. Uh, let's say you had four. You had in fact all of your all of your M one fifties on that side. If you had suddenly mm -hmm. you massively stacked out that side, and I was just met with this hail of toes, then clearly this is where your toe, this is where your AT positions are. This is yes. obviously heavily stacked. This so this is not the place to go. At this point, right? I go I go to my left or something, and I I do a different way around this thing because because that route is not going to work. All right, back into the game. Um, after the combat reconnaissance patrol had done its job, you brought the forward security element in. Um, what were they doing? What was their task? Uh, what this uh, group of or you know mess of BMPs and tanks are doing, because my micro is terrible uh, here, is in theory protecting or guarding the the routes in which you're going to reinforce this area. Because yeah. if you you know, again, you might have a tank platoon in reserve. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do is have a, have a have an M60 platoon in reserve that you're going to use to send to the area where my force is going to go. Hmm. If that force is um, essentially in the valley there, behind uh, where the where the artillery is falling, you probably you can't advance down this route because I've got the CRP here, so the FSC here, sorry, um, who can um, 
who can see that and will engage with this at range with the HDMs and with the um, with the tank rounds. Right. So the, really, the point here is to skirmish and to to fix your position. And it may well be at this point that they engage at long range with other things, and they may well take some losses. But if I'm engaging, if you're engaging the FSC, you're not engaged the main body. Right. So by setting up a strong base of fire, you uh, are both doing recon, finding out uh, about my positions, mm -hmm. and anything that is spotted uh, mm -hmm. subsequently pinned down won't be able to move against your main yeah. force and also uh if something that is not yet spotted does try to move in a into a more advantageous position uh, then you may well be in a position to prevent that yes exactly so uh captain miller is very is very fond of saying that reconnaissance happens throughout the battle and this is an example of that um right. they're not they're not doing reconnaissance in the sense of them sneaking forward and trying to spot things and whatever but they're absolutely doing reconnaissance in terms of giving me information about the battlefield and yeah. that is their primary role at this point, because they are an, an enabler. So they are they are trying to set the conditions for the main body. Is the main is the the defining trait, which right. maybe which may may be killing things, but it may not be killing things. It may just be finding you, restricting your movements, and uh, trying to give me the best possible chance I can uh, for the for when I roll the dice. Right. So I'm looking at your entire forward security element now. Who are these guys in the last B and P's? Oh, incidentally, these are this platoon. The final platoon are the um, machine guns and the grenade launchers. Mm. Um, so these are these are actually a defensive element. The reason why they're there is to dismount and to provide uh, defenses for later uh, for for counterattack, basically. So, in an ideal situation, if the forward security element uh, breathes through you. Then the forward security mm -hmm. itself would stay intact, but that platoon wouldn't. That platoon would stay back and would uh, defend the objective. And while the FSC then goes and does other things, you had this uh, or rather a, a detailed plan. If this, uh, then that. Uh, where are we in that plan right now? What's going on, and what has caused you to do that? Sure. So the CRP has done its job. I know. Mm -hmm. I know where your positions are. I've got spots on some infantry on the objective. Uh, there may be an M13 there, I can't remember. There are infantry and M13 in front of the objective as well, which I'm currently trading fire with and skirmishing with. Um, I know, more importantly, where the tow launcher is in the top right corner and where the M60 is in the hold down position in the field. Right. Your anti tank assets are your assets. They, these are your defense, as far as I'm concerned. So I am really yeah. only concern, I'm concerned with tows tanks and dragons that's basically it nothing else actually matters as far as um my planning goes why is that why why is infantry not a factor so infantry not a factor because i'm basically not going to dismount um unless i have to or unless there's a reason to do so uh hmm. i i'm basically a mechanized force where i'm i'm i am a bmp the infantry are along for the ride they are a supporting element to the bmp not the other way around um hmm. so or rather if you like, primarily, I'm an artillery force, and secondly, I'm a mechanized force, and thirdly, there's some infantry in there somewhere. Um, that's yeah. about where we're going. So essentially, yeah, the anti-tank elements are what's going to stop me. Um, you know, you can't you can't shoot my artillery down, but you can uh, you can shoot my BMPs. Worth mentioning, of course. Um, so in general, the the U.S. Uh, defense is really built around tow hmm. at this in this time period. Um, their their M60s are fine, but they are. They're, they're, the, the U.S. were waiting. They're basically, the U.S. were waiting for Abrams, basically, and waiting for Abrams mm. for decades. So the M60 was just upgraded, but it was it was still an old tank, and it's it's not a very capable tank. It's it's completely fine, but it's not amazing. Um, yeah. Unlike Abrams, so the tow is essential the central defense, and in the Soviet mindset, the defense are the anti-tank defenses. So essentially, you know, your infantry, your everything else doesn't actually matter. What matters are toes, dragons, tanks. And that's these are the things I need to care about. So I need to care about the toes as the primary thing because they are the they are the main threat right. to my to my force. You say that um, basically I'm an artillery army. In combat mission, every army gets artillery. Is the Soviet army in some way better off? Uh, so generally, yes. Uh, the Soviet artillery tends to be a bit cheaper. Um, they tend to have, they can have more of it. So the 
they get the 120 millimeter mortars as standard at the battalion level, which is something which the US can have and move towards. But the US having that is actually quite unusual for NATO even. Um, and it will become rarer as you have other other NATO factions in Cold War. Uh, so having the 120 millimeter mortars there is great. Uh, it also means that the, yes, if you, if you compare prices, uh, quick battle prices, so they're not really fond of doing, but if you compare quick battle prices, the, the 152s compared to the 155s, for example, um, the 155s will uh, typically be uh, significantly more expensive. Um, I think you worked it out. It was um, it was uh, 5.1 points per round for the 152s and 6.1, 6.2 points per round for the 155s, for example. Right. Uh, so you can very easily end up with a, basically getting another battery on top of whatever the US can bring. Right. So you said I don't um, really like to compare uh, points cost. So why 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 is that? Oh, so uh, quick battles are warping. Um, they are they they use they're a lovely thing to have uh, because it does mean you've got infinite scenarios. But one of the problems with a quick battle is that you don't have any kind of operational context. Uh, which a scenario will a good scenario will tend to have. So there's nothing stopping you. I mean, you know, you can play shock force and you can put down more AT-14s than the Syrian army has ever had, for example, um, mm. on one map because because you can you can buy it and it's there. And and rarity only goes so far. So it, it's fine, but it is it is an artificial environment and it does change. The relative value of things, or what, how how things are going. So, it's useful, um, and it's useful. It's a nice thing to have, but it's it's worth knowing that it's it's not necessarily the the be all and end all of uh, of what CM is or can be. So you said I don't know how to play a Soviet battalion without at least three batteries of artillery because there are basically three moves that you have to make, and each move needs to be supported by artillery. Do you feel that same need for that amount of artillery when you place the U.S. Army in Cold War? So everyone needs artillery. Um, <clears throat> the, the difference is, and it, this is even even more exaggerated in um, in like Black Sea and Shock Force. Uh, but the difference is that because the corner times are that much shorter, you can afford to be that much more reactive with the U.S. artillery. Right. So you can have one five fives, which are tremendously powerful mm -hmm. um, with you know calling times of like three four minutes, yeah. which means that you only necessarily need a small number of rounds to do the job. So your one battery could potentially be in reserve um, and just doing putting the fires where they need, rather than trying to mass fire and and sh and shape geometrically, like shape in the way that I was I was doing about denying areas and blocking sites and and pushing things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very different use case, I think. Um, artillery is still absolutely vital, and you absolutely have to have it. But it's um, it, it's it, the fundamental principles of of, in, of, in, of how it's used is very different. Right, which also means that you would re require less artillery if you can move it around faster and it does its exactly. job quicker. At least, at least in theory. Now that's an open question, actually, and I think I'd be really interested to uh, just in in general terms to really dig into that um, because that's the theory of its employment and that's the theory of of why the native force structures are what they are um but i um yeah i i'm not entirely sure that's uh, that's right i just i don't i don't know it'd be interesting but anyway we can agree that the advance guard main body then uh, moved up quite successfully until they got attacked in the flank by another m60 so at this point i i have essentially cleared the way for an attack on mm. the right hand side um obviously i didn't mm -hmm. know the tank was here so the tank is a good position to to start ambushing things and start you know uh putting holes in, in tc4s which is uh, as they want to do so there's an interesting point about losses um the because uh, you know clearly here this is this is a huge amount of loss of life um the point being though that you know, typically in attack, you're at number three to one or so. Mm -hmm. And if you're at number three to one, then your M6, your M60 here has to be doing uh, three to one damage to, to, to draw even. If your M60 there 
takes out two two T sixty fours and then dies, then you're losing, hmm. and you will you will continuously you you will keep losing. Um, it is inevitable that you're going to take losses, uh, especially if you have really lazy micro. So you're going, especially in in any attack, like moving is dangerous, and I have to move to win. So. I'm going. There's a certain amount of risk that I'm accepting by doing this in the first place. So I'm going to take losses and do things. But behind them, there's more platoons and there's more guys and there's more situations. And there are going to be setbacks. But you need to be. You, you have a situation. You have this. You, know, you have an inevitability, right? You have you have this this weight and this this mass behind you that can keep going, keep pushing, and keep on with the plan. Right. One thing I have seen in uh, quite a few people do, for example, is to have a situation like this where it has something they don't expect and then they grind to a halt. I've been guilty of that. Because, in fact, actually, it's one of is a really good example of that. And it's such a shame because in that video, you do so much right. And then, you know, you've got a tank in a, in a hold down position and he just holds up the entire column. Yeah. And it means that, yeah, because you suddenly this one tank is then is then stopping it which then means that the rest of them behind them can then react and then you lose all that tempo you lose you know you lose all the advantages that you've built up um which you know that the tenuous trans story things like it's not it's not a all these like in theory these the the, the shaping and the enabling has created advantage but that advantage is fleeting and if that advantage uh, slips away, if you lose the tempo, if you lose the speed, then then you're going to lose. Right. No, and not 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 accepting losses uh, means uh, accepting that you will be losing the tempo, which exactly. will cost you exactly to that. get behind. Completely. And that's that's the problem. And it's yes, it's, ideally nobody dies. And if everything works out great, then nobody dies, because you know. If there was nobody there, mm -hmm. or if I had um, done something to stop this happening, if I had anticipated this could happen and done something to stop it, like a smoke screen or something similar, then nobody would have died in that situation for my thing. I would have just quietly rolled up the sides and everything would be great. Yeah. But that didn't happen, and it didn't happen. It's it's it's, it's a failing of mine. Um, you know, it didn't happen. It's a it's a thing that's there. It's the risk of doing that. But the point is that I still have the tools to react to it, and I haven't completely abandoned my plan because i have because i have a plan because i have this whole thing sketched out in advance so there isn't an option to abandon the plan there is no course of action where i where i stop and rethink um because if i stop and rethink i've lost right and i you know i still might lose at this point it's still entirely possible that i run into heavy defenses and everything falls apart that's entirely possible but you know i shouldn't lose because of one m60 one thing it's put up a lot is how sort of brutal and and heartless this kind mm. of thing is, and that can be the case. It absolutely can be the case where you just send in a, a whole battalion and they all get wiped out, and it's, it's terrible. However, there is a good there is a good counter argument, and the counter argument is that a lot of the time, uh, the the more sort of piecemeal, sort of cautious approach uh, that will typify a NATO army or a lot of other armies. Um, are that you you know you're sending you're sending forces piecemeal you're you're sending in teams you're sending platoons or whatever things the problem can happen is you can suffer a death by a thousand cuts right that you can end up sending a platoon and that platoon dies and you send another platoon somewhere else and that platoon dies and whatever and you end up doing these little cautious things where you don't achieve your goals and you just die in the process and it may take a while but you will you will end up uh losing sometimes uh, a lot more casualties than you might with the soviet attack because the soviet attack is one big dice roll like this main body is committed i don't have another option right if if this attack is doomed to failure it might be doomed to failure you know hours before we started um but the if this attack uh is doomed to failure it's going to fail and if it if it isn't then it's it will succeed and i've done what i can to set it up to enable it i've done what i can to round off the edges and to to try to give myself options and to try to make sure i'm choosing the best option doing the best things but ultimately i'm making a dice roll which which, which is mm -hmm. the function of the excellent attack exactly but ultimately i'm making a dice roll and i'm committing to this plan and this plan will succeed or fail based on the strength of everything else i've done it was just based on the strength of my 
my um, planning based on strength of the echelon attack, based on strength of, of how well I've managed all the all the bits together, how well the parts have integrated and coordinated. Hmm. Um, and potentially, if it goes well, then I may well end up suffering far less losses than a more piecemeal, um, cautious approach. Right. Because, and I'll, I'll leave them in one go. Like I'll take, you know, I'll take horrendous losses in one minute, but maybe those losses are going to be less overall. So when we talk about Soviet doctrine, it's always about the attack. Uh, look at the campaign, for example, or at books and movies, etc. It's always the Soviets attacking. You'd almost forget that they could do something like a defensive battle. What what would a Soviet defensive battle look like? So the thing to understand about uh, the Soviet way of war is that a lot of it is derived from World War II. Um, and the one lesson, the one key lesson that they took from World War II was that they never wanted to fight World War II again. Right. And therefore, defense really wasn't an option. Um, because defense is fighting on your land and it's giving up your land in, and, and lives and everything else for, for, for time and space. And that's, that's not okay. Hmm. So, so that's why I think focus on attack. The problem with being focused on attack and the problem with the focus, so the problem with being focused on attack is that the, those principles of mass and tempo don't work defensively. Uh, fundamentally any defense you need to you need to spread wide and any attack you need to go narrow that's true no matter who you are and what you're doing mm -hmm. the problem of going wide is that you can't mass your fires because i cannot guarantee because the attacker can choose where they attack right, right. so if i i have to go wide because i don't know where you can attack and if you attack me in one area i can't guarantee that that everything i have has line of sight to that area mm. so i can't guarantee that i can mass all my fires against you so that's the challenge you have to overcome. Right. The way that it's done um, was generally through defense in depth and generally through fortification digging in. Mm. So you'd have uh, you'd have positions and the positions would be mutually supporting and the positions would be fortified as much as possible. On a tactical level, then the focus is on counterattack, and the reason why it's on counterattack is exactly that reason. It's so you can mass things to an extent. Right. The problem with counterattack, of course, is that, especially in defense situation, is that you are, it's a lot harder to gain local superiority. And it's not the kind of battle which they wanted to fight or expected to to win. Hmm. Which meant that you know, defensive doctrine wasn't as well developed and wasn't wasn't the focus. And so it wasn't the focus of the equipment or, or anything else. But so so imagine that you and I are playing a quick battle mm -hmm. and I'm attacking I'm attacking as the US player, so I get a point advantage yep. over you. Um, what what of these principles do you toss out the window of the Soviet doctrine and what do you think you can keep to still come out on top in this defensive battle? So you're definitely you're definitely attacking you're definitely using um, echelons because you are thinking about things in terms of what force is going to engage and what force am I keeping in reserve because of that counterattacking force is really important. Hmm. So that is that is true. It's a very different kind of way of doing it, but again you are you're definitely making sure that those you're not trying to engage with everything all at once, right? You're definitely trying to keep those separate. You are looking at things in terms of um, in terms of mass because again that's you need to create those local local advantages. So you need to make sure that counterattacking force has mm. as much advantage as it can do, which will be use of artillery to shape. It will be it will be um, use of the terrain. It will be use of fortifications and things. Um, right. So so yeah. the strategy that the US player could use by putting an uh, an ito somewhere on a hill way in the back, uh, waiting for something to drive past, shoot at it, and then uh, move away, would not work. You would want to mass at least a platoon's worth of BMPs in that tree line to sort of uh, stack the statistics uh, in your favor again. Yeah, I'd, I'd, want, I'd want to have essentially a static a static defense in depth um, with, with platoon, platoon size positions probably, uh, or perhaps larger, but probably, probably platoon size positions, which can support each other, and then mass as much as I can in my counterattack force. So as much as I think I can get away with, I need to keep in reserve and keep control over so that I have that force to deal with. Because that's how you gain the tempo, which is still relevant, because I still need to be pushing, I need to be setting your attack off by by hitting you in places you're not expecting or in, in mm. times you're not expecting. So I still need to try to gain that tempo advantage. 
I think it would be a very interesting battle. Yes. Oh, and, and <laughs> challenging. challenging. The, 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 the downside is that again, it's it's really, you know, the, there's an argument that there's just it's just losing slowly, and and that it's not the best. Um, it's not dramatic, and it's not the clean, cleanest or clearest, you know, illustration of that kind of thing. Anti-aircraft defenses. Uh, uh -huh. You you could buy what you wanted, but you chose to bring a couple of shulkas. Yep. So the uh, battalion. So uh, my my force selection was just straight off the off the card, essentially, apart from the artillery. So it was it was what is applied to me. Um, with the battalion, you have the choice of a pair of shulkas or a pair of uh, strellas. So mm -hmm. um, guns or missiles. It doesn't really matter which. There's also some man pads. Um, with the way that anti-air works in combat mission, uh, there isn't a huge amount of tactical nuance to it. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to make sure you've got view of the sky because the, mm -hmm. the aircraft is represented. Um, so you need to make sure you've got view of the sky that's relevant or as much as possible, basically, but it's relevant for, what, for what's going to be attacking you. Mm -hmm. But more than that, it doesn't really matter. So just somewhere on the map is probably fine. The important point, though, is that it exists. <laughs> right. Because the Soviet anti-air right. is very good. Um, and it's it's one of those things where it kind of has to be, because the US air is very good. Um, but it does mean that it's always, like, it's part of the battalion for a reason. And it's always mm. useful to take for a reason. One thing right. that really right. frustrates me is actually how um, are people using their anti-air in a direct fire role against ground targets? Because especially shulkers, they they have so they they have such a high rate of fire that they will they will lose all the ammo very quickly, and then yeah. you've got no defense. And mm. it's so important, as, as shown here. I think I shot down both the cobras. Um, and yeah, 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 so. yeah, yeah, yeah. They were both gone, indeed. Yeah, uh, I, I must say I've been guilty uh, uh, of uh, blasting <laughs> a few buildings here and there. Indeed, indeed. Um, all right. So you said that the Soviet uh, anti-air was was so good. Did they have a technological edge uh, in, in, in in this uh, aspect? So they did, kind of by accident. Um, the The US had had various. The, the US has had a terrible history of of anti-air programs. Um, in just just endless sort of procurement problems. Um, I forget the name of the the, the main the Cold War uh, system off the top of my head. Actually. Um, Oh, Sar Sergeant York was the system. So Sergeant York was the was the system that was basically there according to Shulker. And it was extremely sophisticated and uh, didn't work, basically, mm. um, because it was too sophisticated. It was trying to do too much at one time. Uh, and, so, and so basically all of the uh, US systems are expedients. They're, they're, all, they're all some kind of... Um, they're just what's there, right? Um, in Cold War, you have an M113 with a Vulcan minigun, and mm -hmm. you have a, a truck that has um, Sidewinder missiles and things. And they're fine, and they exist, but they're nowhere near as... Then they're not a integrated air defense system. All right, lastly, I have her in front of me Field Manual 100-2-1 of the US Army. Um, Soviet tactics and operations. And on one of the first pages of this field manual, there are some bullet points with principles of the Soviet military art. And I'd like to read a few of these principles to you and then let's discuss if we think that this can be applied to a combat mission environment. Could you explain this one? I found this principle to be to sound very interesting, but I did not really understand what it means. Maneuver first with firepower. Firepower is maneuver. How is firepower maneuver? So, if you imagine, so if you remember, if you remember from the game, I was constantly moving my fires, and my fires were constantly uh, shifting and constantly moving up and protecting the next thing. I remember. So, what that's doing is it's denying terrain to you. It's <clears throat> you know, maybe it's killing any, any, killing or suppressing anyone in the terrain, but more importantly, it's denying the terrain to you and it's creating that kind of situation. And what it's doing sort of more fundamentally is it's changing the geometry of the battlefield. So a really good example, I think, is that is that original toe in the corner mm -hmm. because that toe was in, the position, was in a very good position and it's a position which I couldn't deal with. Um, it's in a good position because right. it was on reverse slope, so with the space behind it. So all it needs to do to disengage is to move backwards one space, and I couldn't see it. 
So it can fire, it can go back and reload, it can fire again. You could probably easily get kill a tank platoon with that vehicle, um, all us being caught. Uh, so I cannot outflank that tow. Right? I've got to approach that right. tow on that, on that line. But if I start the mortars against it, then I force you to move. Now, effectively, that's 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 an equivalent, right? I'm I'm not I'm not avoiding I'm not outflanking the tow, but I'm forcing the tow to get to a worse position. And like, outflanking is you know getting to an advantage position on somebody. So what I'm instead doing is I'm forcing you to disadvantage yourself. So I'm gaining an advantage by doing nothing. By doing so, also gaining the freedom to exactly. maneuver for your own. Exactly that. Yeah. All right. Let's look at the next one. Combat maneuver units must be mobile and capable of rapid movement. I think that's more on a st- strategic level. Uh, yes and no. I mean, again, the really in that battle, me taking <coughs> the rise in your left, my right, um, was the battle, and I needed to get there. I needed to get there fast. Um, so I needed to be able to move there. One thing I didn't mention, of course, was the, was uh, how amphibious the Soviets are. Because the majority of the Soviet vehicles can swim. And that means yeah. that suddenly you, again, the, the geometry of the battlefield changes because you can get across places where you couldn't get across before. Um, and suddenly that means that like you can't you can't guarantee that this river is blocking, right? And you, you can't just pretend you can't just protect the bridges. You've got to protect potentially the entire river. So all that's part of it. Um, but you need to be able to move and you need to do that. You're absolutely right that it matters even more at the strategic level, but it does matter at the tactical level as well. The last one, um, I, I, I I wonder if you uh, feel like I do, that this one is actually about, could, could reflect on the C2 system in yep. combat mission. Maintain effective continuous command, control, and communications. A loss of communications leads to loss of control and defeat. Yes. Is it quite that dramatic in combat mission where you are a godlike, all-knowing commander? No, it, it definitely isn't in that sense. Um, however, sides that have worse C2, worse spotting, sorry, sides that have worse spotting rely on C2 far more in combat mission. Hmm. So... This is one of the reasons why with the infantry, if you do dismount them, uh, which is an option, uh, if you dismount them, then you want to keep them in voice range of the BMP because the BMP has the radio and the infantry don't. So an infantry squad that's out of contact with the BMP can't communicate with anybody else. Now, yes, you have a godlike perspective as a player, but what that means is that your units aren't sharing spotting contacts. And if they're not sharing spotting contacts, then the individual... Uh, units on your side won't spot the enemy. They won't resolve those spotting contacts into into full spots uh, as fast, which means that the enemy is going to spot you faster than you're going to spot them. Yeah. So the more you pay attention to your C2, the better your fighting is going to be. And especially when you're trying to maximize your mass and trying to maximize your firepower at every stage of the Soviet things, that's really important because you really need to know you need to like you need to be able to get that that spot off and get those things in there. Right. If the Soviet army is about um stacking the statistics in your favor, mm-hmm. then um communication of targets is 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 uh, a multiplier. Now, I'd actually argue that every army is about stacking uh, st- the, the the stats in your favor. The difference is the Soviets are more blatant about it. So that's the material that I still had lying on the cutting room floor after the video was done that I thought was worth sharing. Now jump ahead a couple of weeks to after the release of the video and we decided to jump back into the studio to go in depth a bit more on some loose threads that I felt we had left, some questions we had actually raised but not answered and to talk about some questions and comments that we saw were posted under the YouTube video quite frequently. After the video came out, we've seen uh, quite a number of of comments and a number of those comments mentioned that uh, going up against an M60 in the T64 was not fair and that the T62 was the standard uh, Mm -hmm. of the time. Uh, Is that that actually true? I don't remember in what year we fought. I believe it was 1981. I believe it's 1980 because that's my my default, my, my preferred my preferred year. And you set it up, then it must have been 1980. Yeah. Yes. In the Soviet campaign in Cold War, you're playing with T62s. 
Mm -hmm. You're actually playing with parts of the... Um, yes, you're playing with the 120th uh, Motor Rifle Regiment. And these, this is a TC2 formation. Now, what's mm -hmm. curious, um, uh, Zawa from the CM Discord, she produced for me a laydown of the um, all the various Soviet tank units and tank dispositions uh, in 1979. Right. It's really interesting to see uh, because the divisions tended to be uh, three regiments of one and one of the other between T-62s and T-64s. Mm -hmm. So the 120th is a motor rifle regiment, had T-62s, and that motor rifle regiment was alongside two others with T-62s and one of T-64s in the division. But there were other divisions which had three T-64s and one T-62. So it's about an even split in terms of the frontline um, actual deployments. Uh, in terms of what would be tip of the spear in a in a combination scenario. So it sounds to me like an M60 was just as likely to face a T62 as a T64. Yes, to to an extent. Um, I do think you're you're on balance slightly more likely to hit T62 than a uh, T64 in in um, if you're playing the US. But there's it, it, it's not as it's not as lopsided as it may as it has been claimed right so i guess that both tanks were standard tanks now people who in the comment section would suggest that the t64 was an overmatch for the m60 said that the t62 was about on par with the m60 what's 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 your take on that so that's that's what the u.s manuals of the period basically suggest hmm. um there's a lot of uh operation analysis or a lot of a lot of um uh, a lot of mass involved and basically the t62 has a slight advantage uh inside a thousand meters and the m60 has a large advantage outside a thousand meters where, where um, do those advantages come from so the advantages are probably to do with spotting for the, for the sake of the m60 because the optics in there are significantly better according um, to the manuals According to the manuals, but also, I mean, they are <laughs> the, the the actual optics are, are significantly better. Um, the T sixty two seventy five has a laser rangefinder, which does mean it has a more sophisticated uh, fire control system than the M sixties. So it's reasonable that the M sixty would spot first in general uh, mm -hmm. by those standards, and it's reasonable that the T sixty two is more likely to get a first round hit. So also, each have their own qualities, which yes. kind of makes it. On par in the that's, in, that's in, the in, idea in, in the US doctrine view Absolutely. of the time. Now, what I did was I created a scenario with a lot of separated lanes, and in those lanes, I pitted M60s of the Rice variant against T62 75s one on one. And this way, I was able to do some statistical research, and I ran 200 one on ones. Now, what I found was that in a one on one situation, the M60 would come out on top eight out of ten times at the shorter ranges and 9 out of 10 times at the longer range, it's beyond 1500 meters. So it would appear that the manuals of the time thought more of the T-62 than Comet mission does. Has the consensus about the quality of the T-62 shifted since the 1980s? So it is, it's quite possible, so there's a number of possible explanations. Um, it's quite possible that the manuals were overstating uh, the the enemy that's genuinely good practice it's also possible that it's a gameism does it make sense that the m60s chances increase even more mm. as the range increases yes i mean it's, so optics are the main are the main thing and the i mean the m60 has a commando with a good vantage point with their own set of periscopes their own set of optics mm -hmm. you know that there, there are all these they have a much better they do have much better visibility and much better chance of seeing things in general so i did the same thing for the t64 i pitted the t64 against the m60 200 times and what i found was that in a one-on-one -on -one, the m60 would come out on top about six in ten times the difference being that as the range increased the m60's chances would not increase they would stay about the same unless you looked at the chances of spotting first and hitting first then the m60's chances would increase but that didn't mean too much because as the range increased the shells of the m60 were more likely to bounce off the t64 in fact this happened all the time 
Now, if I had been a tanker in the 1980s, then I would have been very worried about my job occupation, knowing that my shells would not be able to penetrate the T-64. So very famously, the advantage the T-64 had was that it got rid of a crewman and it massively uh, upgraded the armor, particularly mm -hmm. the frontal turret. They also uh, were the first to introduce uh, composite armor. So you have, um, you don't just have a block of steel, you've got layers of um, glass and plastic. Hmm. Sounds like you're leading into an answer that says, yes, the M60 crewmen were in for a bad time. <laughs> so they were in for a bad time and they were surprised by it. Uh, the the amount of up armoring that the T-64 and T-72 had was a surprise to the US. Hmm. And in particular, the composite armor was very effective against heat rams, so HDMs especially, because it does it basically is designed to deal with the weapon systems that they're up against. Which makes sense. Yeah. So it should be difficult. Now the complexity to this is there is allegedly a bug hmm. with the T sixty four B where it has more armor than it should. I don't right. know how which is going to make that statement more complex. I don't know uh how accurate that is. I don't know which armor, you know, I don't know to what extent that's a major problem. Do we know um, it's a bug or is it just a grievance of the community that feels the T64 is too hard to kill? So it's on the bug tracker, so it is it is oh. a bug, um, as far as that's concerned. So I it, it is something which is certainly being being looked at and presumably will be adjusted. Right, um, but it, it's yet to be seen by how much then I suppose. Indeed. And obviously that uh, but the T-64 should have a ton of armor, and it should be able to shrug off uh, an awful lot of what the US can throw at it in that time period. Hmm, right. So um, even though something might change, um, my observation that um, range uh, is not as important for the T-64's mm -hmm. uh, chances of success as it is for the T-62 will probably remain true to some I, I think I think in the broad sense that's likely to be very similar. So lo last thing about the uh, the hit chance percentages mm -hmm. in the comment section in, in in the comment section of the video there was a viewer um, who said how how can you say that the T sixty four only has a thirty five percent chance of coming out on top against an M sixty rise this is pure NATO bias mm -hmm. well clearly in the video you said let's give an arbitrary number and let's say that the T sixty uh, four has a 35% chance. Yep. So I did a 200, uh, no, in this case, a 400 sample size, 200 times at 500 meters, 200 times at 1500 meters. <laughs> Do you care to know what the, 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 the percentage kill, the kill percentage is of the T64B? Go on. It's 37%. You were <laughs> 2% off. <laughs> But, but 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 still, yeah, it was an arbitrary number. You just threw it up from the top of your oh, yeah. head, but you were oh, just two percent points off. Yeah, I mean, from as, yeah. From, from the comet mission reality, I should say. Oh, completely. I mean, as I said, like comet mission, like all war games, comet mission is always going to be wrong. Um, there's always going to be, uh, it, it's never going to be a a correct or a, or a real reflection of reality. Um, it's just a question of understanding how wrong or understanding what answers you're getting out of it, if you like. Mm -hmm. All right, knowing what we know now about the differences between the T-62 and T-64, let's talk about quick battle points. Um, from the T-62 to the T-64 is about a 30% step up in price. So for every three T-62 platoons that you can bring, you can bring two T-64 platoons. So what would you prefer, uh, more of the cheaper T-62s or fewer of the more expensive T-64s? Keeping in mind that Soviet doctrine is about mass. No, it's a good question. I actually... <laughs> there's, there's, could it be that to this question, both sides could be argued? Yes, I definitely think that's true. Um, I definitely think it's possible to argue it from both sides. I think... There is a bias towards quality and in, not, in commission. I'm not necessarily sure it's a bias of the game, but it's definitely easier to play 
you know, if, if you have something that can see first, shoot first, maybe shock off a shot, like mm-hmm. like an Abrams tank, then it's very easy to make to make that work. Could the bias towards better quality um, come from the fact that uh, better hardware is more forgiving to the player? While yes, when you, when you, yeah, when you're playing the the the, the cheaper stuff, um, you have to be on point all the time because yeah. every every mistake will get punished. Yes, so Shock Force is the easy example of that um, because it's the most extreme example of that. Uh, in Shock Force, it is entirely possible to do everything right and still to, to, to play as Assyrians and do everything right and still lose hmm. uh, because you because you're up against uh, a, a blue force that has generations of advance over you it doesn't mean it's impossible and it doesn't mean that it's um, it's not uh, it's not a challenge it's not worth doing uh, but it's certainly it's certainly the case that it's there's a lot less pressure on the player it's a lot more forgiving um to have better kit so perhaps then it's fair to say that um a player who starts out playing as the soviet army and who wants to try out this doctrine stuff for the first time is um well off taking the t64 as it's a bit more forgiving and then when you're ready for the full-on soviet circus experience that when you can make a step to using more yeah. but cheaper t64. i think so i think it's that kind of it's that kind of situation um it's, pro- it's probably a reasonable way of doing it it's definitely. I wouldn't necessarily say the T sixty four is for beginners, but it's certainly, but it's certainly a good, a sensible default hmm. default position to start with. And where does the T eighty fit into this whole discussion? I noticed that um, depending on which variant you take, the T eighty costs about as much as the T sixty four. Only the most expensive option is just a smidge over. Hmm. So they're going to have better ammunition. Um, they're going to have. They have a better engine, so more hmm. mobile. Uh, they are they are a little bit more vulnerable, um, which is probably why it's about the same price. Mm-hmm. Because one of the things that the T eighty has is the uh, it has more periscopes in the front, right? Um, so the optics are significantly better on the T eighty than the T sixty four, but it does mean that there's also this enormous weak point directly in the middle of your hull. You've shown us the Echelant attack using a BMP company. Would that have worked if you brought a BTR company? Yes, yes, I think so. Um, it would have been. It perhaps would be more tentative. It perhaps would be slower. Um, it perhaps would be less decisive. Um, getting you know the every step of there is going to be less impactful. Um, but I, but the fundamental concept would work quite happily. I mean, it, it could be in trucks. You know, the, the, the fundamental concept would work. We work with anything. Um, that that is a very nice experiment. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's it's not again. It, there's downsides to that, right? <laughs> like, <it's laughs> yeah, harder. yeah. I can think um, of a few. Yeah, completely. But it's you know it's harder and it's it's a thing. But I mean, the the fundamental idea is is as valid as anything. There are differences. Obviously, the vehicles themselves aren't quite as mobile. It takes longer to dismount, and they don't have an ATGM. Um, and it takes longer. Up. It takes longer to dismount. Yes. On top of all of that. On top of all that, yes. Um, and, and obviously worse off-road and everything else. Uh, the the way they compensate for that is that the BTR formations have uh, weapons platoons. These are the weapon platoons or the ACDM, the, the anti-tank f- uh, formations, are uh, paired two to one. So there's, mm-hmm. pair, there's a pair of AT4s and there's an SPG-9 recorder's wire form. Uh, right. These would be used together. Uh, the idea being that each can compensate for the other's weaknesses. Uh, right. The AT4s have a minimum range, uh, whereas the SPGs don't. If you have this sort of position that it's, that's combined, then it gives you a um, that they support each other. Right. They, they they both cover different distances, short yeah. range and long range. So the in terms of how you use them, there is going to be a difference. Obviously, um, mm. you can't push through quite as fast. You you have to be a bit more tentative. You're maybe dismounting a bit more, or whatever, but the the fundamentals are identical. Uh, mm-hmm. You are trying to achieve exactly the same goal and exactly the same thing. You're just generally uh, worse at it or or slower at it, uh, which also means you're worse at it. Right, because every time you want to mass your firepower, you will have to disembark your guys with the ATGMs, and then you lose tempo through yeah. that. Absolutely. 
so so the the classic the classical thing uh, which i think is actually wrong um but the classical thing is that you'd use yeah, the bmps would be the the breakthrough and the btrs would be cleaning up hmm. mopping up the survivors um i actually i'm not sure it's actually true uh, but I certainly have heard that claim before now, so it might be true. Let's look at this through the wonderful world of quick battles. What what does this all mean then? For a quick battle, um, the difference then is cost. Um, the BTRs are significantly cheaper. If you're playing a huge battle, you can take mm-hmm. a full BMP task group formation with enough artillery. And a, a huge battle in the attack because that yes. is the multiplier yes. in the attack roll. Uh, Absolutely, is sorry. Yeah. So in a in an attack situation with the Soviets, as huge, you can take a full BMP task group and enough artillery, which is, right. again, probably at least at least three batteries or something. Yeah. Uh, with the with large, you can get a BTR battalion of the same group. Mm, and that would make sense because even though you have fewer points, you'd still want to put enough mass on the map, as it were. And what about defensively? If you're going to be doing a Soviet defense, you're probably better off with a BTR formation. Um, they have, well, you have the dismounted HTDMs for a start, which are going to help um, defensively. Mm-hmm. The in a defensive situation, you don't necessarily need the mobility quite as much. Um, mm. You do, you do for a counterattack, but you don't. It, it's nowhere near as 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 much as you need it for for the attack. Uh, right. So having these static positions where you are, where you are dismounted, infantry dug in. Uh, is something that a BTR can do just as well as a BMP. Right, with the advantage that um, dismounted ATGM infantry is notoriously hard to spot in a tree line, mm-hmm. and BMPs are yeah. quite easy to spot. And of course, you can have more of them because you're 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 playing you're not playing with a BMP. So this is, all right, so so um, recon with tanks. So you have to, the the the. Uh, combat reconnaissance patrol, usually mm-hmm. a platoon of three BMPs, and, and basically mm-hmm. you said um, sometimes they could have a tank with them. Why? Why do yeah. that at all? So the reason to recon with tanks is that is just for firepower. Fundamentally, mm-hmm. um, your reconnaissance platoon will typically be made up of whatever your uh, your, your formation reconnaissance were made up of, whatever the IFV of the main of the main body was or the battalion was so it's going to be a btr or it's going to be a bmp or whatever Hmm. and sometimes depending on what you're up against uh sometimes you need the additional firepower um so a really good example which isn't in combat mission called war currently uh is the british scimitar Um, What, what, what what is the scimitar the scimitar is a is a is a light tank uh right. it's, a, it's a reconnaissance vehicle um it's about eight tons uh but the important thing is that it's it's very small it's very sneaky and has a comparatively massive 30 mil cannon hmm. which if you were in a hold down defensive position uh with a pair of them and you were coming up against three btrs or three bmps even is going to be a very strong match for them, if not an overmatch. Hmm. Um, and it will, because the 30 mil will go straight through them. So if you are fighting something where you're expecting strong opposition and you're expecting to have to fight for information, then having a having a large, having a tank is is the fire support, which is, is the way to solve that problem. Having a tank is a way to solve that problem and a way to, to, to fight your way through through a strong opposition. Right. It... it, it would be there to ensure that the CRP can continue uh, going forward longer than they would be uh, without the tank. Absolutely. Well, again, the, the the worst case for CRP is that you pop over a hill and you lose the entire CRP without any, without gaining any information. Right. So, so if I were to do this in a in a in, in a match, um, would I put the tank up front because it's most likely to shrug off any hits or would they be in the back because they're too conspicuous or what 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 would typically be done so it does depend i think by default you want it in support so you want it behind you want to be leading with the probably with dismounted infantry but leading with with the with the infantry and then you bring up the tank when you need it Hmm. um but you know if you have to push somewhere through through somewhere where you think there might be mines or whatever or particularly dangerous area then sure you, you lead with the armor all right now I hope you're ready for perhaps a bit of a tough one, mission planning. So 
people have seen our video and may want to try out doing something like this in a head-to-head -head game or scenario or whatever and they open up this map and they have all these units and where do they start what sort of advice can you give to people about mission planning so i think in the broadest sense this is actually one of the most important questions in combo mission hmm. uh, it's something which having a plan having a plan at all uh, is probably one of the one of the biggest steps you can do to actually getting decent at cm Right. Uh, and there are an awful lot of people who don't. So in the broad sense, this is a really important topic. Um, it's also a very large topic. There's a load of different ways of doing this, and a lot of them do the same thing. So with the United States, they have uh, METTC, mm -hmm. Mission Enemy Troops, Terrain, uh, Time, and Civilians. Uh, the uh, the British Army has the combat estimate, the, the seven questions of the combat estimate. They're achieving the same goal. They're actually very similar in practice, even though they're, they approach it in different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a really excellent uh, armed general series on combat mission, which goes into this concept far more than I can do here. Uh, and and it's, it's extremely good. And I would suggest putting it in the comments, uh, put it in the description. So it goes into these mission planning concepts in a combat mission context and teaches people how to do that. That's the thing. So people people enjoy Sun Tzu's The Art of War because they can get all of these one-liners out of it that they feel helps them. Mm -hmm. Is there <laughs> is there an art of war of the Mad TC? <laughs> yeah, so so the the, the one-liner is that you have to to create an advantage, you have to do something. You have to take an action. You're making a move or you are doing a fire mission or doing something and that's going to create an advantage position for you hmm. the way you turn that advantage into something decisive is that you stop them doing whatever they need to do to to counteract it a really basic example that i've had before is if you imagine you were a weapons platoon so you had a couple of machine guns and mm -hmm. there's a patch of trees in front of you that you know an infantry platoon has gone into. Right. So you're guarding the flank. Your job is to sit there and and defend and make sure they can't advance through you. But obviously they're in these trees. The reaction you're going to make is to call mortar fire down on the trees. The reaction that they would do at this point is one of two things. Either they come forwards, which is what you're already prepared for, because you're pair machine guns on the flank, because that's what you're mm -hmm. there for, or they go backwards in the route they've already walked into the trees. So right. how you then turn decisive is that you can, with your machine gun platoon, maybe you move one or two of the machine guns uh, to slightly to the left, so that you are then uh, have line of sight to the, the line they'd have to retreat through. So now they're in a situation right. where they can't retreat without being shot, they can't go forward without being shot, and they can't stay there without being shot by mortars. Right. So you're causing them to have to react, and then every reaction that they can do is then actually uh, has become a lethal one. In the, idea, in the ideal situation. Right. Well, you already told me before we started this recording that this is really a topic that's, that could be an entire officer's course in itself. Um, so we'll just link into the armchair general series and uh, leave it at this, uh, uh, well, I think helpful one-liner here. So the question that we got quite a number of times in the comments was, um, nice doctrine, looks very scary. How do I defend against this as the US Army? So what they came up with was something that's called active defense. Active defense was born out of operational analysis. Uh, so born out of the data from, from Vietnam, World War II and Korea and whatever else. It was a way to do defense in depth and was intended to be able to fight at odds of six to one. Mm -hmm. So having been outnumbered six to one by, by the Soviet army, how are you going to do this? So at the battalion level, you would have um, a cavalry unit uh, out in front, which was screening. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have the three companies of the battalion uh, behind that. And these would be covering the, the possible avenues of approach. So each one would take a sector. 
So let's say A, B, and C, right? So let's say the Soviets attack into sector A. What what do the other two companies do? So what was happening while they're preparing to fight is that the two companies which are not being engaged are then supposed to retreat, um, and they are supposed to fall back to a position which is behind the first company. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, if your first company is in front, second company and third company are behind with another prepared position they already have thought about, and another prepared kills it. All right, so I hear you describe four different companies, but you also said that mm -hmm. Defense in Depth had been created with the idea of overcoming a six to one ratio, mm -hmm. which would mean that we would need six Soviet battalions if we wanted to play this out in any accurate way. And this is this is one of the issues with representing this in combat, combat mission. Right. Um, you can do it. Uh, you can't do it in a quick battle, um, and you you're pushing it for what you can actually show. Hmm. Uh, the scenario Bear in the Sun uh, in Cold War uh, does a very good job of showing exactly this. Mm -hmm. um, that's that is that is the right way to 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 see this in action. Right, this is incredibly deep map, so to speak. Yes, yeah, and it's 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 a huge map and it's an enormous force which is which is coming on in pieces, and it's it does it does a very good job of doing that. Um, the problem that they had with actual defense is that it turns out essentially it didn't work. That's a problem for a defensive doctrine. It is. Yeah. The main the main issue, of course, is it's asking an awful lot of of the equipment and it's asking an awful lot of the training and, and all the all the problems that they had uh, it didn't necessarily solve. The interesting about common mission is that some of those disadvantages may not actually apply. So active defense may actually be better in common mission than it is in reality just because you can coordinate far better with yourself than, than you mm -hmm. can necessarily with a battalion. Yep. Um, what the US moved to uh, is, you can also see in common mission, uh, which is in the, the later period, which was the Doctrine of Airland Battle. Mm -hmm. Airland Battle was um, is m more relevant operationally than it is on a CM scale, but the it's also about creating depth but the depth is created in the Soviet column. So the focus then is in using, especially air assets, but using deep striking assets to interdict and to uh, to disrupt the Soviet force as on the march, and then to, to isolate this sort of forward element, which you're going to counterattack. But that also doesn't really apply to, to combat mission, of course. You can't, Not can't really in, interdict into the enemy lines at the start of a scenario. I mean, no, you, you can, you, but you'd be, you'd be right in the deployment zone. That's the thing. You can't you can't really see the full thing in a combat mission sense. You can certainly see the counterattack. You can certainly see see aspects of it. But it's and you can definitely see, uh, you know, you can definitely see an Abrams. Um, but yes, you can't see the same um, same situation. So that's a brief overview of how the U.S. defensive doctrine evolved. But are there any lessons in there that players can use when defending as the U.S. Army against a echelon attack? Yeah. So it's still the still the fundamentals. I think are still sound. The Soviet player needs to needs to have mass and needs to have tempo. Mm -hmm. And if you can throw them off that, um, if you can force them into situations where they can't mass or they are continuously reacting and, and wasting time. Then you can start hitting them with indirect fires, or you can start um, you can start treating them. And either way, they're not gaining the advantage that they need. So, how could you uh, throw the Soviet player off balance? So, yes, an elastic defense is a way to do that. Um, just as an example, if you you know have a platoon that's defending in a in a tree line, and they it takes time to set up an attack, so they, they are setting up an attack for this tree line, and that between isn't there anymore, then the attack is then that what time setting up is not doing anything and it's then wasted. Hmm. You know, they, they attack into nothing and then and then what? And then you're in another tree line that's behind them. So you can there is definitely that kind of thing. Those kind of principles are certainly sound and certainly a way to uh, a certainly a way to do that. Um, what is probably worth talking about though is is the capabilities that the US actually have and the advantages the US have. Well, yes, but first I'll say mm -hmm. that I don't think that defense in depth could have worked for me on this no. map. No, on the map we were playing on, the the map was very shallow. Um, that is not true for all maps in combat mission, um, and it's not true for all maps in combat mission Cold War, but it is true for most of the quick battle maps. Don't, I don't think it's true that a larger map would have favored the US in that situation. You don't um, think so? 
I, I don't think not inherently. Um, I think the uh, because of, again you start getting things like the T C T wars armor mattering more um, because of the range or or the guided missiles the the huge number of ACGMs that the BMPs have mattering more. So it, 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 I don't think it's as simple as that, but it would definitely give us both more options. <laughs> yeah. That way. So you said I think it's worth to go into. Um, the assets that the U.S. player has at its disposal. Yes. A lot of the discussion is often around tanks, because people like tanks. Mm. And it's easy to compare tanks to other tanks. So one of the great shocks with going from cold, going to Cold War from Shock Force is that, or even Black Sea, is that you don't have an Abrams. You don't have this overmatch uh, sitting on the battlefield where you can sit on a ridge and destroy everything. So the, the tanks fundamentally perform a different role and it's more of an enabling role that's, that supports everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, the tanks you know, can't hold, hold terrain as well as the infantry can. The tanks don't kill other tanks as well as the tow missiles can, but they can do both of those things and they can, tra- they can help the others transition between them. Mm-hmm. In terms of the, the, the the uh, the actual advantages or the defined advantages, um, the infantry squads themselves are very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're significantly larger than the Soviet squads. So if you are in a situation where you are using small arms, you you have a significant advantage there. Um, you have a high rate of fire. You've got a lot more guns, um, and generally that's very powerful. Right. Uh, you also have dragon. Dragon is not amazing. Not even in CM. Arguably, it's worse in reality. Mm-hmm. But having a squad-based HGM is, in this time period, extremely unusual. And right. it means that you can do accurate firepower out to a kilometer, which is, is very powerful, potentially. Yes, It will very often um, bounce off the front of a T-64 or, or higher, um, but it will go through a BMP, and then they have an awful lot of them. It's three, three dragons per squad, right? Yeah, three dragons per squad. And the uh, squads also have a large number of laws, um, which I think in CM is five, if you count the ones in the in the M113. Mm-hmm. So every squad then effectively has eight, eight things which can potentially kill a tank or potentially kill an armored vehicle. Yeah. And most of them won't. But if one squad can potentially destroy almost a company's worth of armored vehicles, then you know, your platoon can do quite well. So what does this mean defensively? So it means it means defensively that it's going to be hard to wrinkle US infantry out of complex terrain fundamentally. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're in buildings, if they're in if they're in woods, if they're in you know if they're in if they are dug in, then they're going to be a pain for the Soviet player to deal with. Okay, to summarize. So of the different defensive doctrines that the US Army developed, the elastic defense was probably the lesser one, but also the one that is somewhat applicable in combat mission. During an elastic defense, uh, combat teams leapfrog back to attrit the Soviet Army while the Soviets keep attacking into uh, basically nothing. And in real life, that takes a lot of coordination. It's very hard to do. But in CM, those darn sides are not as pronounced. So it's actually probably easier to do that in combat mission because you only have to coordinate with yourself. So you can use that technique to break the tempo of the Soviet player and then hit them with indirect fires, air support, maybe surprise attacks or whatever. Um, As you mentioned, the US infantry is perhaps an underappreciated asset uh, as it has uh, quite the number of anti-tank tools compared to Soviet infantry. Uh, earlier, you said that the Soviets only care about anti-tank assets, not so much in, not not so much about infantry. But so I guess that in more complex terrain, the U.S. infantry actually has formidable anti-tank capabilities, and that's that's how I take this. Um, also, you said that tanks are popular, but mainly, certainly the M60 is more of an enabler than it, that it is your key asset. It's supporting your toes and infantry what they do best. Is, is that about right? Yes. Like the M60 is a core, a core enabler of everything else. Um, you absolutely need it, uh, but it isn't necessarily the, the thing which is getting the job done, but it is necessary for everything else to do their job. When you go hat to hat, what do you 
is the best Cold War simulation that Comet Mission can be? What settings would that be? So outside of doing a crafted scenario, crafted scenario or all the, all the campaigns, um, when the Cold War campaigns are excellent and do a very good job of, um, of communicating these sort of uh, core ideas. But trying to do this in a, in a quick battle sense, um, the, my default position is that you probably want to be looking at, at an attack defend, um, mm. probably a Soviet attack, but not always. Uh, you want to be setting the map to large or huge, generally. I said the, the points values are large or huge. Um, I my rule of thumb has been you want at least one of the dimensions of the map to be three kilometers or more. So like three by four, three by three, three by two, maybe. Um, but definitely that that seems to be about right to um, to have a have a decent frontage and have some room for maneuver for both sides. Right, but is that for depth or for width? I, it actually depth generally, but it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, I just I think if you've got a map of that size, you can make the depth somewhere, even if you're going sideways. Um, and for the year, I really like 1980 as the year. Um, and I tend to put it on strict rarity. Um, so the rarity points are, are significantly more constrained. Uh, the reason for 1980 uh, is, so the rarity is a multiplier on the, on the base cost, and it depends on, uh, depends, on, depends on the year in Cold War's case. Hmm. So the same vehicle might be really common in one year, but incredibly rare later on. Um, right. And the rarity is not a function of how good it is. It's, it's a function of how many are in the theater, uh, essentially, how many are available. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, in 1979, the BMP-1 is has sta- is the the IFV that has standard rarity. It has a zero rarity cost. Uh, in 1980, it's the BMP-1P, which is the BMP-1 with the 85 HDM rather than 83 HDM. Right. Um, the thing with 1980 is that you can't get the Bradley at all. Mm-hmm. But you can get essentially everything else. So you can get T80s, you can get the Abrams. However, you get them at an extremely high rarity cost. Right. So you can take them, you can still play with whatever toys you like, but you you have to pay for it, and you can't um, you can't have a lot of them. Uh, which is a decision I quite like, and I quite like what that does to the game um, because it means that. Sh- it feels probably at its most balanced and it probably feels at at its most representative of what the Cold War is. Um, one of the issues with going later is that the further the more thermals you add and the the more the more advanced the tech is, the more the game starts to look like uh, shock force right. and becomes this asymmetric um, generational gap situation, which I think is a lot less interesting uh, fundamentally. All right, so that's 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 uh, that's a wrap. <laughs> I almost say we've we've gone through so much. Thank you so much for uh, for uh, coming online and uh, yeah, playing you. this game with me and, and, and explaining all of this this to all of us, mm. uh, giving your take on uh, the Soviet doctrine and how to apply that in combat mission. Yeah, no, <laughs> thank you. I mean, thank you. No, I, really, I really appreciate that because it's actually honestly it's something which has. It bothers me, and again, it, it bothered me. It even bothered me with your video, right? It bothered me that that you were, but it bothered me you were doing everything so right, and then and then faltered, right? And you made up for it with yeah. the with the next one, you know, um, <clears throat> with the river crossing. Yeah. You did, you did, you did well. But it was, uh, yeah, it, it was it was frustrating because because you didn't have to stop. You know, you could have just gone, right. and you would have been fine. <laughs> you know, just yeah, I get it, I get it. So. Uh, if if anything, then after after this video, you should maybe uh, find some more opponents online who uh, who do things that make you go yes. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping you do that. Hopefully, that will be something. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you tremendously, and I'm sure we'll uh, we'll see each other around uh, yeah. sometime soon. Yeah. No worries, man. Thank you.